right, so I am on my way to my vet right now, and I've got my fecal sample. You are told to put it into a plastic bag, put it into the refrigerator, and then get it to the vet as soon as possible. I, I use a Ziploc bag, and that's because you want to keep it <laughs> together. You don't want it uh, to, uh, you know, you don't want to put it in paper or anything like that. So you keep it together in a Ziploc bag. The way I get it in a Ziploc bag is I turn it inside out, put my hand in the bag and uh, grab it, and then put it in the refrigerator. And what we're doing is we're trying to keep things from degrading. Uh, one of the things we're going to want to see, the vet's gonna want to see, is the flagellated protozoa, and for that, they need to be alive. So uh, the refrigerator slows them down, and it slows down the decay and uh, and things drying out. Uh, I think that's one of the most important things is you got to keep it from drying out, and uh, and then get to the vet as, as soon as possible. Uh, I am lucky on in this particular case that I got a fecal uh, on a weekday night, which means I can drive it uh, to the vet office in the morning, and so I can get it uh, taken a look at pretty quickly. I don't know if they're going to be doing it at the office or if they're going to be sending it out. I know they have some capabilities at the office, uh, but uh, they probably will have to send it out if they want to do something substantial. And in this case, I just want to know what those round things are. Uh, they just, mm, they look like Hexidia, but they're not, they're not, I, I think they're too big. Maybe they don't show the uh, the oocysts on the inside, and so it's close enough to something that's dangerous enough that it's worth it for me to pay the money to have the test professionally done. Now, it's common for me to hear from people that they don't have a reptile vet around them, and that is an issue in, in many cases. With an analysis for a fecal sample, you may be okay. You can ask them, if they know where to send the sample to get it done because not everybody does fecals even the reptile vets not all of them do fecals in-house it's because it's just so much better so much uh, more thorough to send it out and so e even if the vet near you is not a reptile vet you can call them up and say hey do you know a uh, a facility because I mean they're doing fecals for cats dogs and whatever else they do see the chances that that facility would be able to take a look at a reptile poop is probably pretty good so you can see if they can at least do the analysis even though they won't be able to offer expert uh, uh, care or the next steps at least you know if you've got something that you have to deal with and uh, getting it from a professional lab is a real good way to know what's going on. All right, so they took a look at it. Dr. Greek took a look at it. Jackie took a look at it. Another one of the vet techs took a look at it. They all looked at it, and they weren't able to determine what it was. It wasn't obvious. They're thinking it may be something that came from the insects, uh, that it's a little bit big for coccidia. So anyway, we're ha uh, having it sent out to uh, a professional lab and they're going to take a look at it and I'll let you know what we come up with. Um, and <laughs> I would love to know uh, what this is because I see this in so many of the, uh, the, uh, the shamrock chameleon fecals that I get that I need to know. And, and and you know what? If it's not coccidia and they don't know what it is and we can tell that it's non-pathogenic, I'm fine with that. All I need to know is I don't have to worry about it. But uh, if it is something I need to worry about, I want to treat it because I see it uh, commonly in my shamrock communities. Well, everybody, it's been quite a day running around town and such, and there's still more to do. 
Tomorrow I'm going to be talking about a plant that we discovered is not good for chameleons. But there's more research that I got to do tonight to make sure that what we're doing is not a knee-jerk reaction. Whenever I say that there's a plant that's bad for chameleons, I want to make sure that what I say is as accurate as is possible. I mean, what happened is uh, Jonathan Hill found that some of his babies were uh, hurt by a certain kind of Tritoscantia plant. Uh, I'll give you all details tomorrow. It was corroborated by another breeder, and so it looks like this is a uh, credible threat. And so we need to take precautions. As many of you know, I have a plant section on the chameleonacademy.com website where I list the safe plants. And I keep saying over and over that I don't know of a plant that's actually dangerous to a chameleon to eat. And to be fair, this wasn't a... Uh, an example of ingestion. This is a defensive hairs on the surface. So uh, anyway, I'll give you details tomorrow. I need to look into it a little bit more before I say something. And this is part of what it's like being a chameleon wrangler. This is the chameleon keeping lifestyle where we constantly are learning. We're constantly challenging what we think we know. And the exciting thing about that is Every day is a new day. And that's one reason why it's very cool to have a vlog like this. And so I can just do a daily touch point and tell you what's going on at the time, at the exact time that it's happening. Now, before I go, I've kind of got a win-win situation here. I have an affiliate relationship with thebiodo.com. And if you use the coupon code chameleon10, you get 10% off of whatever's in your cart, except for some cages. I get credit for that and that helps support this educational outreach. And so if you need to replace UVB lights or you want to get some bioactive soil or any of the other many things that are on the BioDude website, just use the coupon code chameleon10. And many of you know that I work with chameleon enclosures. And so that big enclosure back there, that's from Custom Reptile Habitat. That's a Chameleon Academy branded enclosure line. And that helps support this outreach as well. And this is another reason why I think we're entering into a golden age of herpetoculture. Not only one is the general community more aware of quality of life and enrichment and they're caring about the uh, reptiles as more than just black boxes that you put food in, you get poop out. We're approaching them as if they are sentient beings with working brains that need to be enriched and taken care of. But also the companies that are a part of this community are becoming more and more aware of content creators and are seeing the value in supporting these kind of outreaches. So you're going to be seeing more and more shows being sponsored. I mean, Paul Barclay, who does the Custom Reptile Habitats, he's been supporting podcasts and video podcasts for a long time. Josh Halter from the Bio Dude approached me and said, hey, we really like what you do. If we give you a coupon code that gives your audience 10% off, could we use that to support your show? And so I, I know when you go on social media, sometimes it can feel depressing and you can think that, ah, this community is so messed up. But if you ever do feel that way and you're discouraged, uh, I just want to let you know things are getting so much better and you are part of an exciting growth period in herpetoculture. This is an exciting time to be part of it. And so I'm very glad that you're here. And I'm going to get to work on tomorrow's episode because there's a lot to share. So have a good night and I'll see you then.